Hello, my name is Father Gregory Pine, and I'm a Dominican friar of the province of St. Joseph. I teach at the Dominican House of Studies, and I work for the Thomistic Institute, and this is Pines with Aquinas. In this episode, I would like to talk about being sad. Why? Well, here in the 21st century, many of us are sad. We experience in a way that's pretty profound, that's pretty visceral. Uh, and for those of us, perhaps, who aren't sad, uh, or at least not sad much of the time or most of the time, we still encounter it in our family and in our friends, and we want to condole with them, like we want to compassionate them. So what are we meant to do with sadness? You know, there are people out there who propose life hacks or quick fixes, and maybe there's something to it, but maybe you've tried one or two and you've found them wanting or lacking. And so you're asking the question like, well, what do I do with my sadness, right? What am I going to do with my sadness? Because it seems like my sadness is here to stay. Uh, so in these instances, it's great to consult the Christian tradition so that we can profit from its wisdom and not just like use it as a technique, but actually assume it as a life because it is intended for us as a life. So let's think with St. Thomas Aquinas about sadness, like what it is, how we're meant to live in the midst of it, and then some small remedies for sadness that offer us hope as we persevere through the course of our lives. Here we go. Okay, so a first thing to say is that uh, sadness itself is morally neutral. All right, just taken on its own terms, it's morally neutral. Neither good nor bad, just kind of is. And I find that to be very freeing because I think in many Christian circles, there's a kind of pressure to be happy because happiness, we are told, or joy, we are told, is the kind of testimony that the gospel is true. And we believe the gospel is true, don't we? So we should be happy or we should be joyful. But that seems to run roughshod over our experience because, as it turns out, there are just some sad seasons in life or there are people who are more inclined to sadness. And I think that we need to be honest about that. And it's okay to be honest about that. In a certain sense, it would be weird if we weren't sad in sad seasons of life. Um, yeah, because it's entirely appropriate. So it doesn't matter so much whether or not you are sad or the length of your sadness, the duration of your sadness, the depth or gravity of your sadness. It just matters what you do with your sadness, okay? That's probably part of the hand that you're dealt. The question isn't so much whether or not you have a good hand. The question is how you play your hand, and God gives us grace to play our hand well, regardless of those cards that turn up, okay? So that's the first. The second is um, God gives us virtues with which to contend with or to deal with or to otherwise kind of heal and grow beyond sadness. All right, and you can think about this like, obviously people are, are employing various means, uh, you know, like they might be in kind of pastoral counseling or a kind of sustained, you know, spiritual direction or confession type relationship. They might be involved in therapy or counseling or whatever else as a way by which to consult with a clinician or a professional, or they might be deploying other means still, you know, like a holistic wellness practice, something along those lines, right, as a way by which to confront or to address. And those are all good. You know, those are all good things, and you might be able to use some kind of combination of them. Um, but we're also looking to kind of interiorize these principles. We're looking to assume them as a mantle, not just as something exterior that somebody else does for me as if they were a, an outboard motivation motor, but that this is something that I myself can kind of take on for a habit, for a second nature. So St. Thomas describes various virtues which help us to confront sadness. One I want to identify in particular is patience. So when St. Thomas talks about the four cardinal virtues, he talks about prudence, justice, fortitude, and temperance. And specifically zooming in on fortitude, he says fortitude really, it equips us for facing the danger of death. All right, so it's, it's the virtue of soldiers, the virtue of martyrs. Right? But he says there are various other dangers in life which we still find difficult, and so we need other associated virtues as a way by which to confront them, as a way by which to kind of bear up before them. And he identifies patience and perseverance in a particular way as dealing with the sorrow of life and the length of life. So we can be honest and say, like, I experience life as sorrowful. I experience its duration as painful. What am I meant to do with that? Well, St. Thomas says, cultivate patience, cultivate perseverance. God, in his loving kindness, in his generosity, has kitted you out or equipped you with these virtues at your baptism, and he wants to grow them in you, right? He wants to mature them in you, and he can. So the ordinary means whereby we, you know, grow in virtue is the Christian life, you know, so we're trying to pray and make good use of the sacraments, and we're trying to engage in Christian friendship and introduce some penance into our life, and we're trying to study the faith and serve the material poor. And when you live your Christian life, it has a way by which of reinforcing and, you know, maturing the life of virtue 
in you. So that's just to say, right? Don't judge it, right? You can permit some sadness in your life insofar as it's a reflection of what your life is. And then, um, right, we're in conversation with those people who are competent to help us in these matters, but we're trying to interiorize it by the life of virtue, and we do so by living our Christian lives. But St. Thomas adds, and this is kind of my final point, uh, that there are some remedies for pain and sorrow which we might employ, or some kind of simple things that we might try out. And a lot of them just, you know, they correspond to our experience, they make a ton of sense insofar as they're they're just human, right? But uh, these six remedies of pain and sadness also reveal to us who we are, right, before the Most High God, and how we're meant to be, ultimately. So I think that they're super fruitful just to meditate on, even if only briefly. So the first that St. Thomas mentions is pleasure, okay? Uh, and you're like, wait a second, is this just like hedonism masquerading as Christianity? No, no, no. I don't mean it in that sense. When I, when I say pleasure, I mean like delight or joy, the type, of, the, the type of response that we register as human beings when we embrace something good, something that fits us as human beings, something that perfects our nature. So it might be something simple like food or drink, you know, like an ice cream cone or your favorite milkshake. Both of those are ice cream things. Apparently I've got ice cream on the mind, regardless. Uh, or it might be something, you know, like more elevated that produces that pleasure, you know, and we'll, we'll get into various sources of it. But we're looking to escape some of the tedium, some of the weighing down, something, something like the fatiguing influence of sadness. Because what we find really difficult about sadness is that it's like it clings so closely to us, right? And it seems to drag us further and further into the pit of sorrow and despair. And so we need some alleviation of that. We need some lightening of the spirit. And pleasure has a way of doing so, you know, like actually causing us to experience something even like rest, a kind of contentment, right? We said delight or joy in the presence of the good, which is fit for us. All right. So sometimes it's best just to kind of change the scenery, right? To engage with something which you know at you know, like at base or at very least, will will cause you some yeah, some delight or some joy. Now, St. Thomas goes on to say, like, what are, what are ways in which we gain access to these types of delights, whether bodily delights or spiritual delights? And he starts very simply, right? He starts very humbly, and he says, cry it out, okay? He lists tears, which I find so delightful, so wonderful, because it's so true. <laughs> you've probably been in a situation where you've thought, like, I would feel so much better if I could just cry. Like, I feel so sad but I'm all just torn up and I can't get it out. I need to get it out. St. Thomas says just that. We have to let out what might otherwise consume us or fester within us, right? Because when it remains locked up, ugh, it's oppressive, right? It's terrible. But when we give adequate expression to what we are experiencing, there's a kind of, again, a kind of delight or a joy that flows from that. Like we as human beings are meant to express outside what we feel inside, not unscrupulously or not like, wow, that's ugly. Or like, you really think that's a pretty, you know, like whatever. So we're, we're not meant to be crass or we're not meant to be without filter, but we are meant to be honest, right? We are meant to exteriorize what is interior. We are meant to manifest or communicate what we hold within, uh, because that reconciles us to our reality. It reconciles us to our environment, right? And there's something just wonderful about about crying, right? So St. Thomas says, fitting operation, give it a try. The next thing that he says is the compassion of friends. You know, like maybe you've had the experience, maybe you have anxiety, and uh, maybe that manifests in insomnia. One of the worst things about being up late or in the middle of the night uh, without being able to sleep or without getting any relief from the torture of that mental exercise is that you feel alone, you know, like you feel acutely your own isolation, your solitude. And it's like two, three, four in the morning. There's, you don't feel like there's anybody that you can call unless you have friends in other time zones because uh, everyone's got their phone off or on silent. Nobody has landlines anymore. And like maybe you have a roommate, but you know, like he or she's got a big thing going on tomorrow and you don't want to deprive him or her of sleep. And yeah, it's just like there's something about that that's just especially terrible. But when we have a friend, uh, it's just it's a difference of night and day. Right. St. Thomas says the compassion of friends is such a relief because um, they share the burden. Right. We have the impression that they're sharing the burden with us. And so we experience that burden as lighter. Like you don't have to bear it alone. You might think it noble to do so. You might think it, you know, strong to do so. You might think it heroic to do. But it, you don't have to bear it alone. No one intends for you to bear it alone. You can bear it with your friends and that will alleviate some of the burden. And then also when we share it with them, we perceive that they love us. And that's delightful. Right? That's one of the greatest of delights, to know that you are loved. Because 
all of us want to know, desperately want to know that we are loved. So St. Thomas mentions delight and tears, the compassion of friends, and then he moves on to the contemplation of truth. And this might seem kind of sterile to you. It might seem kind of like, oh yeah, that's great for Mr. Intellectual Pants, but uh, I don't know that I'll uh, get like any delight out of this. But but like, don't, don't, don't worry about um, yeah, comparing yourself to St. Thomas Aquinas. St. Thomas says, contemplation of the truth affords greatest delight, okay? The more so as one is a lover of wisdom. But uh, what he's talking about is like recalling something that you know to be true, which keeps you rooted and grounded in your identity and your mission as a person, such that that sadness doesn't suck you up, right? Or draw you under, under the waves of its despair. Um, so there are going to be like moments when you feel the sadness creeping in and you feel the anxiety creeping up and you're like, I'm not going to get the thing done in time. I'm not going to be able to hit the deadline. I'm not going to be able to, I'm going to get fired and I'm going to get ridiculed and I'm going to get, all right. In those moments, you can repeat to yourselves certain truths, you know, like I haven't missed a deadline. I always get it done in the past. I got myself all worked up, but then I had an extra hour and a half at the end of the day, which was unforeseen and really wonderful. Um, so you can repeat simple truths, right? But there are more kind of sublime truths that you can repeat to yourself too. Like, I fear that I won't be loved if I fail to meet this deadline. Well, I, would, I know that I'll always be loved by God because God doesn't love me because I'm lovable. He loves me because he loves, right? God puts love there. God puts lovable there. And there I am, all right? So like, this does not change whether or not I am a beloved son or daughter of God. Like you can abide in those truths and contemplation of those truths can keep you rooted in reality when sadness and anxiety might threaten to swallow you up or abstract you from reality. So you can think here of like the witness of the saints or the witness of the martyrs who even in the midst of torture, even in the midst of most acute pain and suffering, kept in mind the one thing necessary, kept in mind the highest of truths, and that oriented them like the North Star, you know, it oriented them such that with it between their navigational beacons, they didn't turn astray. So this is kind of like the climax of St. Thomas's consideration because, you know, the most intense form of pleasure is, is bound up with this love of wisdom, which we as Christians seek to be. Not mere like lovers of wisdom like the philosophers of old, but lovers of wisdom who is Christ Jesus, our Lord, who is wisdom of the Father. All right? So <laughs> having attained to the height of St. Thomas's meditation on this particular question, then we can descend with him into the concrete particular peculiar details of our little human lives, because the last two things that he adds are sleep and baths. <laughs> um, maybe you've been caught in an anxiety death spiral. Um, and you know, when you like can't sleep one night and then you're all worried about getting sleep the next night and makes it harder to sleep the next night and so on and so on until such time as you cut that cycle or you kind of cut that pattern and then you get good sleep and then it's easy to get good sleep the next nights. Right, so, so sometimes we just need that break. We need that release because sadness has a way of perpetuating itself, right? It keeps us up late, right? It gets us up early. It continues to plunge us in fatigue and, you know, aggravation and frustration and all things besides. Sometimes we just need distance from it, right? We just need our bodies to rest. We just need our minds to shut off. We just need to get away. And sleep does just that. St. Thomas is his own little, like, theory as to how the body works in the 13th century, which there are things about it that are right, there are things about it that are wrong, but the basic insight holds, right? So we need to kind of get back to where we ought to be, and we can't let our minds or our bodies run away with us, uh, because, yeah, that's that's not what they're meant to do. Um, so yeah, then like baths, I just love that. I mean, like there's a sense in which, you know, we retain a lot of tension or we retain a lot of trauma, and sometimes it's good just to... <laughs> I don't know the last time I've taken a bath, right? To take a bath or to like take a, a shower or so, whatever you do. I don't know. It doesn't matter if I get into details, it gets weird. Um, but it's, it's the other thing, you know, it's, or it's the type of thing which affords delight, right? Which relaxes the body, which gets you out of your head and kind of into your body. And then lets whatever it is that you've been holding on to go in a way that helps you to see the things in perspective and then ultimately treat them as they ought to be treated. So again, from the top, don't judge sadness from the outset. Morally neutral. What matters is how you respond. What matters is how you treat it. 
and you can treat it well even while yourself still being sad because there are going to be sad seasons in life and there are going to be people who run sadder than others. All right. That being said, we're seeking to cultivate the virtues whereby to interiorize the sound principles taught to us by those who are competent in these matters, right? Whether it be, you know, a pastor or a clinician or, you know, we're, we're competent in these matters too. We shouldn't think that's just like a mere matter of consulting experts or consulting someone else when God has given us means whereby to persevere in the good life. So to live our Christian lives, that's the next thing to keep in, keep in mind and keep in heart. And then to consult these remedies as a way by which to yeah, profit from delights, which can help us to reset, recharge, and then re-engage. So again, there are delight, tears, compassion of friends, contemplation of truth, sleep, and baths. That's what I wanted to say. So this is Pines with Aquinas. If you haven't yet, please do subscribe to the channel, push the bell, and get sweet email updates when other things come out. Also, I contribute to a podcast called God's Planning. Two cool events coming up. The first is a day of recollection in Columbus, Ohio at St. Patrick's Church in Columbus, Ohio. And, and the registration for that is at godsplanning.org. It's free. Come one, come all. You just got to get yourself there. And uh, Father Bonaventure and I will be doing some talks, some podcasts, adoration, confessions, mass. It's going to be a jamboree. All right. And then we also have a retreat coming up in Malvern, Pennsylvania, June 7th through 9th. You can also find registration for that at godsplanning.org. And then you'll get details about payment. That does cost something because it's a weekend retreat. And uh, yeah, that's that's about all I want to say. So yeah, good things to be had by all. Uh, if you're listening to this around Easter, a blessed Easter to you and yours. Know of my prayers for you. Please pray for me. And I'll look forward to chatting with you next time on Pints with Aquinas.